So as we mentioned, and I want to look at the topic tonight of spiritual accounting. And I want to look at some of the hadith about how this relates to you and I. And there's so many different angles that we can look at the lives of the Imams. So tonight I want to look at this one particular example. Spiritual accounting, meaning to look at ourselves, to be able to take account of ourselves. And here is a hadith which I want to begin with from the seventh Imam. In which the Imam has said, he says, Laysa minna man lam yuhasib nafsahu fi kulli yawm. He says that the person who does not take account of his soul on a daily basis is not of us. So he is stressing on the importance of daily accountability of ourselves, daily accounting for what it is that we do in our lives. And he says, فَإِنْ أَمِلَ خَيْرًا إِسْتَزَادَ اللَّهَ مِنْ وَحَمِدَ اللَّهِ That when we do this daily accounting, he says that if we look on our record of deeds and we see that we did some good today, we woke up for prayers on time, we gave some charity, we helped our parents, we helped our fellow you know, uh, people at work or at school, or we did some act of goodness today. The Imam says when you do this daily accounting and you see some good action that you've done, he says that that should make you ask Allah. It should make you ask Allah for the ability to do more and more good deeds. And that you should praise Allah for having given the ability, the tawfiq to be able to carry out these acts of goodness. And he says, وَإِنْ أَمِلَا شَيْئًا شَرٍ إِسْتَغْفَرَ اللَّهُ وَتَابَ إِلَيْهِ And if we come to the end of our day and we see that we did some sins, maybe we made our fajr namaz kada, maybe we didn't pray dhuhr and asr at work or at school, maybe we had listened to something haram, we looked at something forbidden, we didn't do our responsibilities for that day. The Imam says if we sit down and think about it and reflect on our own actions, then he says that we would ask for forgiveness of Allah and we would turn back in repentance to Allah. So this is what I term as do-it-yourself spiritual accounting. You know, today in the world that we live in, because many of us have businesses, we understand that, you know what, it's difficult to run a business on our own. Maybe we have a, whatever that we're doing, but we're always busy 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And we don't have time to do our own accounting. We don't have time to count how much money we make, how much we're spending, how much inventory we have. And so what do we do? We hire an accountant. We'll hire an accountant and we'll pay him top dollar to sit and do that work for us because we just don't have the time to do it in our own busy lives. But when it comes to spiritual accounting, the seventh Imam is showing us, and as we'll see in our discussion, that this is not the time that we have to hire other people to do the job for us. It's not the time that we rely on our wife or our spouse or our children or our community to sit and do this enumeration, we have to sit and make some time out at the end of the day to sit and reflect and think about what we've done in the day. And you know, today is not hard. We all have smartphones. We have our tablets. We can easily sit and count. Okay, we woke up at 4 o'clock. We did this, 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 and this. And make a list of everything that we've done. And maybe assign a value of plus one for every good deed. And a negative for every bad deed. And come to the end of the day and see, are we in the black or are we in the red? Are we in a positive balance or are we in a negative balance at the end of the day? And if we do that, then we're able to actually begin the process of this spiritual accounting in the words of the Imam and being able to actually measure our day in terms of the goodness and the benefit that we've brought not only to others, but more so to ourselves, to our own nafs, and also to our own Yawm al Qiyamat. Salu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The general definition of accounting when it comes to the actual accounting of our money is to say that accounting is a systematic recording, reporting analysis of the financial transaction of a business. And what does it do? It allows us or allows a company to analyze their financial performance and to look at the statistics such as their net profit. So this is what the general world of accounting knows to be this, this principle of material accounting. If we translate that into the spiritual definition, it's roughly the same thing because we're looking, we are recording all of our actions when we do this daily accountability of our actions. We want to report on it. We want to see where are we standing in the sight of Allah. And we want to analyze what did we do. Because you know in Islam it's beautiful that not all of our actions have the same worth. You know, just like when you're in a business and if you're selling a service, 
One service of yours may be $50 or $35. Another service you offer may be $80 or $100. And even products, commodities that we sell, you might sell one thing for $12 and another thing for $35. So you want to see where are you getting the most profit, that your, your cost for that service or that good was this much, this is how much you're selling, this is the, 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 the buffer of your, of your profit margin, and you want to see how you can actually increase that. Islamically, we have to look at the same thing that some of our actions, they have a very little reward, we can say, a minimal reward. But other actions, they have a humongous reward. And sometimes those actions, we don't even know the amount of reward that Allah has put within that action. You know, for example, in Surah Baqarah, Allah tells us that those who give money, those who spend in the way of Allah, Allah says is like the seed of corn that you plant in the ground. You see all the farms that we drive around that grow wheat and corn. You put one seed of corn in the ground and one stalk of corn grows. And on that stalk, maybe four or five pieces of corn. And in every ear of corn, there's a hundred seeds. So that one seed you planted of corn can yield you five or six individual pieces of corn. And a hundred, two hundred seeds. So one seed gives you thousands of pieces of corn back. And sometimes you plant one seed and you get maybe just one flower out of it. So similarly is Islam. Allah says there are certain actions that the reward is a singular reward. It doesn't go any further than that. But sometimes we do an action, we do a good act and it reverberates for, for millennia, for eternity. Such that the rewards continue and continue and continue. Even long when we're dead, when we're in the grave, still those actions are coming back and giving us a reward. So spiritual accounting, it actually deals with a process and rules that account for the needs of ourself. So we need to always be focusing on ourself. It's not bad to look at other people, but Allah tells us in the Quran so many times, think about yourself. Allah says, Ya yuhalladina amanu, alaykum anfusakum, O you who believe, take care of your own souls. He says what? He says that those who try to misguide you, cannot misguide you when you're on the straight path. So Allah tells us, take care of your soul. In another verse, Allah says, Ku anfusakum wa ahlikum. Save yourselves and your families. He doesn't say, take on the entire world. Take on the entire community. He says, take care of yourself and your family. And then, if you have time and energy and the stamina, then look at the rest of the community. So Islam is constantly reminding us to look at the self, look at the self, fix ourselves, correct our own actions, and then continue from there. As we mentioned that just in the accounting world, we always want to be in the black, have that profit, making money, you know, not going and losing. Also spiritually, we also want to ensure that we're always in the black, that our spiritual books are in order, and that we're always in a positive, uh, a, a positive outcome. You know, one of the ulama in Qum, he mentions in one of his writings, quoting a story of a person who lived hundreds of years ago, and this man was writing his memoirs. And he was about 50 or 60 or 70 years old. And he was sitting down one day with his book, doing this hisab, this accounting of his nafs. And he thought to himself, he says that if I, whom 70 years old today, he says, if I, was to, if I had committed just one sin every day for the last 70 years, Seven, one sin a day times 365 days, 365 sins. Times that by 70 years old, 235,000 some odd sins. The man, they say, he fainted and he died. Because he couldn't even imagine that one sin that we commit a day, if we committed only one sin a day for our lifetime, imagine what number that would be. So we need to make sure that we do this accountability on a regular basis so that we don't get to that level of being 50, 60, 70 years old and our beard has turned white or our hair has turned gray. And then we look at ourselves in the mirror and we reflect on all of those things that we did when we were young and we realize that then it's almost, although it's never too late in Islam, we should realize it's never too late to turn back to Allah, but it's very difficult at that point in our life. And therefore we need to, and again, in that minimum is check our deeds at the end of every single day and do the particular tally. Looking at our life now is that we see that there are some basic spiritual accounting principles that we should be aware of. And I try to break up our life into three spans. 
we have our birth to maturity. So here at that stage, when we're born, till we're 9 for the girls and 12, 13, 14 for the boys, none of our bad actions are written in our book of deeds. So now that doesn't mean that we go and sin and that we, you know, we don't pray on our, our prayers or we, that we're rude to our parents or that we do all these bad things. But Allah is giving us that opportunity to get our books in order, to start that process, to get ready to have a responsibility. So we don't have any sin when we're being, from the time that we're born until the time that we're mature. And in fact, the good deeds that we do give us a reward. Even though Allah doesn't need to give us that reward, we don't have to pray or fast or read Quran when we're four, five, six, seven years old. If we do it, we get a reward from Allah. We get that bonus within our books. But then stage two comes, which is the adult life. You become baligh, you become the age of physical maturity according to Islam, and boom! All of your actions are now being written by Kiram al Katibin, by the two angels, the left and the right angel. And they write everything that we do the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everything is within the book. And you know, from Madrasa, for those who come, that you have five categories you have the wajib and mustahab. Wajib we have to do. What mustahab, you, can, you should do it. It's better to do it. You get a reward. At the opposite side is makru and haram. Makru we should not do. There's no punishment, but we shouldn't do that action. And haram is forbidden, and we get a penalty if we do that act. And in the middle there is mubah, it's a neutral deed, neither positive nor negative. So in our adult life, we need to look at that particular stage. Are we doing all our obligations? Are we refraining from everything which is prohibited? Are we trying to do the recommended? Are we trying to keep away from the makru actions, the ones which are not recommended to do. Once we get through that stage of adult life, and that usually ends when we die, I hope, because we're all accountable to do all of the actions, praying, fasting, charity, all those things are an obligation until we die. If you can't pray sitting because you're old, you sit in a chair. If you can't sit in a chair, you lie on your bed. If you can't lie in your bed, you put on your on your side. If you can't move, you use your eyes to make the, 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 the movements of the prayer. So you don't have, we don't have an excuse that we can't pray. Fasting, yes, if you're old, if you're feeble, if you're a woman who's nursing a child who's pregnant, you can't fast. There is exceptions. But other than those exceptions, all the obligations are there until we leave this world. And when we die, we have to appreciate that then our books are technically closed. There are no more good deeds that we can do. But I will mention, and we'll look at this next, is that even when we die, Allah out of His infinite mercy still gives us the opportunity to continue to have good deeds within our records. Not like the world that we live in. You know, once you die, your bank account, the assets will go to whoever your, your spouse is or whoever is inheriting from you. And then they own all of that. They own all of the homes and the wealth and the, and the cars and the jewelry. Your wife will take all of that when we die. Well, not all of it. You know, our children will get some. All the inheritors will get their amount. But when we're dead, that's it. Our wealth is given to everybody else. But our good actions, we actually have a way to continue to have good actions even when we die. So it's not that, okay, I'm dead. I can no longer do good deeds. There's actually a secret that Allah has shown us through the Prophet where we can continue to earn an investment, a return on our investment, even after we're long gone. And we can actually get the thawab in the grave and inshallah on the day of resurrection as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Prophet has told us that there is a way to have a continuous deposit of good deeds. So it doesn't just mean that you die and now nothing is left for you, that you've got no good deeds to meet Allah with, or minimal good deeds. The Prophet says, That when a person dies, all of his good deeds come to a close, except for three. So we know we don't pray when once we're dead, praying is gone, fasting is gone, ziyarat, hajj, khum, zakat, all of those are gone. But there are still good deeds that we can do today, to earn a, a perpetual, continuous reward, even when we're in the grave. The Prophet says, If you left some knowledge behind, which others benefit from, so you were a religious scholar, or you were a secular scholar, you developed a cure for cancer, or for AIDS, 
or you left behind some legacy in terms of the material world. People benefit from that knowledge. You continue to reward, receive reward from Allah for that knowledge which you left behind after your death. Or the Prophet says, Sadaqatin tajri lahu. That perpetual charity, Sadaqatu jariya. So you, for example, donated money for there to be a well dug in the middle of Africa for people to be able to get fresh water from. And that well stays for 30, 40, 50 years. You receive the reward for that. Or you give in the way of Allah to plant fruit trees and people continue to eat that fruit and get nourishment. You receive reward for that. Or you help to build a masjid or a Husayniya, Or you help to publish a religious book. You do some sort of act which continues long after you're dead. That reward continues to be delivered to your account even, on the, even when you're in the grave. And if you don't have knowledge that you can give to people, you don't have the ability to give sadaqat jariya to give wealth, to spread, and to perpetuate, continue. The Prophet says, if you leave behind a righteous child that prays for you, then that itself will continue to give you good deeds. So even at the minimum, if we don't have the knowledge to spread around the world, we don't have the ability to do sadaqat jariya at least we should have the ability to bring up our children such that they can be those who pray for us, who make dua for us, who make that istighfar for us, and that they will be a source of us to have continuous good deeds even when we are dead and long within our graves. Just as Allah has promised that deeds will continue, and this is a very beautiful point that sometimes we, we perhaps miss in dua kumail, is that sometimes we have sins that we perform, and sometimes those sins only Allah knows what they are. We know that we've sinned, and sometimes we'll, one day we'll come in front of Allah, and we'll know we had committed a specific sin. But Allah will not have that within our book. The angel will come out with his book, with our book of deeds, and that sin won't be in there. And we'll be perplexed though, how is it Allah? I did this particular sin, I know I did an act against you, but it's not within my book. And the angels, kiram al-katibin, they'll be confused because they're with us 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But yet they don't even know those actions. This is from the mercy of Allah. As we, we just as we read in Dua Kumail, Allah says, وَكُلَّ سَيِّئَةٍ أَمَرْتَ بِإِثْبَاتِهَا الْكِرَامَ الْكَاتِبِينَ الَّذِينَ وَقَلْتُهُمْ بِحِفْظِ مَا يَكُونُ مِنِّي وَجْعَلْتَهُمْ شُهُودًا عَلَيَّ مَعَا جَوَارِهِ and for every evil action that you had ordered your two scribes, the two angels, to write down and confirm, and they were appointed to write down all of my actions and to be a witness over me, along with the limbs of my body, because we know in Surah Yasin, Allah says, "Alyoma nakhtimu ala afwahihim, wa tukallimuna aidihim, wa tashhadu arjuluhum bima kanu yaksibun." Allah says, "On that day, we will seal your mouths and your hands will talk." And your feet will tell Allah where you went and did haram. Right? Our hands will tell Allah, my owner made me pick up something haram, made me buy that bottle of beer, made me my feet, my feet will say, my owner made me walk to that nightclub or to that casino. We won't talk, our feet will tell Allah. But here Allah tells us that the angels who are recording our deeds and our body parts, sometimes even they are not known, they're not privy to the actions we perform. Because as Allah says, وَكُنْتَ أَنْتَ رَقِيبَ عَلَيَّ مِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ That you, O oh Allah, were a witness, you were a guardian over them. وَشَاهِدَ لِمَا خَفِيَ عَنْهُمْ And you, Allah, were a witness over what you had hidden from the angels and my body parts. But why would Allah do this? Why would Allah tell you and I that He will record all of our actions and our hands and our feet and our face will bear witness? But then Allah says, that some of your actions nobody's going to know about, not even the angels. Why would Allah do that? Why would, he, why would He ever want to not take us to account with His justice? As, Allah, as the Imam says, وَبِرَحْمَتِكَ أَخْفَيْتَ Because of your mercy, O God, you have covered that. You have kept those actions of mine a secret. وَبِفَضْلِكَ سَتَرْتَ And through your grace you have hidden all of those bad actions. So we see that sometimes our sins are so despicable, are so morally depraved, 
But yet Allah, out of His Rahmat, out of His mercy, He covers them from the angels. They don't know what's happening. Those two angels, they don't know what's happening. Our feet, our hands, our ears, they don't know what we've done. Allah has hidden those. This is the mercy of Allah. This is the level and depth and the profoundity of the Rahmat of Allah. When Allah says in the Quran, Rahmati wasiyat kulla shay, that my mercy encompasses everything, this is... Brothers and sisters, what Allah's mercy is, is that even the angels who are with us all day, even they don't know some of the actions that we perform. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Not only the sins, but the other end of the spectrum is our blessings. Sometimes, you know, if you have a bank account with some of the new banks out there today and you deposit some money, and you get your monthly interest rate of 2, 2.5%. Two and, and now some of the banks have started to give you a bonus rate. Because you're a good customer, you go, you look at your bank balance one day, you log into your bank account and you'll see $3 extra interest, and extra interest as a bonus customer, as, a, as an incentive for having your money in their bank. Or they'll give you points if you deposit money in your account. Why? You didn't do nothing ordinary, you just put your money in their account. And they give you bonus on top of the interest. Allah does the same thing to us. Allah also takes that same accounting principle and puts it within our lives. Sometimes we'll look at our actions on the Day of Judgment and we'll see that there's so many good deeds and very little bad deeds. How is that possible? And Allah gives us the answer in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 70. He says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيَّاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Those who repent and believe and do good deeds, Allah will change their bad deeds into good deeds. So you're in a negative balance, you repented, you came back to Allah, Allah flips those bad deeds into good deeds. He removes a negative and He gives you a positive. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Because Allah is forgiving, He's merciful. He doesn't want us to burn in the hell. He's giving us ways to atone for our sins. And here we see that even if we have multiple sins on our account, Allah says, if you follow the procedure in the right path, I will take your sins, I will take your negative balance, and I will flip it around. I'll give you a positive balance for doing literally nothing, just repenting to Allah, turning back to Him. We don't have to do the good deeds. Allah will automatically transform those bad deeds into good deeds. Now that doesn't mean we go out and do bad all day, and then we hope for that, that, that transfer. This is for those who do sins, as the Quran says, in jahalat, in a state of ignorance, in a state of maybe some, you know, overcome by our caprice. So, but we have to be careful that we don't intentionally commit those sins and expect Allah then to turn back to us. One of the last things we'll mention is what is the outcome if we don't engage in spiritual accounting? You know, why do we have to do it? Again, in the world we have accountants, we have to make sure that we do our own books for Revenue Canada, for CRA, for all of these things. Islamically, we also need to do the same for ourselves. The Imam tells us, again, Imam al qadim alayhi salatu wasalam, the seventh Imam, he says that the person whose two days are equal, meaning that you haven't progressed spiritually, he says that that person is maghboon, he's in a loss. So if your Wednesday and Thursday are no different, you woke up, you prayed Fajr, you prayed Dhuhr Asr, you didn't do Quran, you didn't do Duas, you did nothing different two days, he says that you're actually in a spiritual loss at that stage. And worse than that, he says, the person who is today is worse than his yesterday, that he is mal'oon. He is mub'ad an rahmatillah. He is distanced from the mercy of Allah. So even worse than having two equal days is if your today is worse than your yesterday. And he says, and the person does not find any progress in himself. So you're just drudging along at the, at the normal pace, not benefiting, not making yourselves better. He says that person who is in a loss, that person, he says, death is actually better for him than, than life. فَالْمَوْتُ خَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنَ الْحَيَاتِ If we're not spiritually progressing, the Imam says that you may as well be bankrupt. You may as well just not exist because you're going into a greater and greater deficit with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know in this world what happens if you go bankrupt, 
and the government, they will seize your, your home and your car and they'll garnish your wages and they'll do all of that to you. You're almost dead materially. The Imam says, if you're not progressing spiritually, it's better for you to be dead because you're not making that progress to Allah and better to be gone now and meet Allah in a better state than to actually get to that state of not having anything to show with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The final point we'll mention is that do we really need to have an external auditor? You know, today charities and businesses, they'll hire some huge accounting firm to come and do the auditing of their books, to present the financial statements. But Allah tells us in the Quran that we don't need to do that for you and I. We don't have to have a third party come in and audit our spiritual books. Allah says in this chapter, Bani Israel, chapter 17, verse 13 and 14, He said that every single person's outcome, his actions, they're tied to his neck. And that we shall bring them out on the day of judgment. And then Allah says what? That when we come on the day of judgment with our book of actions, we'll be told, Iqra kitabak. Read your own book. Kafa binafsika yawma alayka hasiba. That today you are the best accountant for your own selves. Allah doesn't have to tell us to go heaven or go to hell. Imam Ali doesn't have to say you go to heaven and you go to hell. Although Imam Ali is Kasimul Jannati wa Nar, Imam Ali will determine who goes to heaven and hell. But Allah tells us that we don't even have to have Mola there. We ourselves will know where we belong. We ourselves will know should we be going towards Jannat and Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam or should we be going towards Jahannam and the enemies of Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam And inshallah we won't be in that boat because we will take account of our souls and we will work to ensure that our record of deeds is in the positive. And as Imam Ali salam has said, and this is a beautiful hadith from the Imam, where he says, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu that take account of your own souls before they are taken account by Allah. So we have to be sure that we ourselves do our own accounting, not waiting for others to do that. And that if we do that, then we inshallah will be in the black, will be in the positive, and we will meet Allah on the day of resurrection with the honor and the prestige of being of the Ahlul Jannat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wow.